please join me in welcoming both Carrie and Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> yes, right. So, Carrie, I would like to echo thanks on behalf of Leadership Louisville for joining us today and for being so incredibly generous with your time, making no the problem. trip in from Lexington. And I'd really like to start from the top, um, something that I'm guessing may be on a couple minds in the room. Uh, why big ass? Why not? What a also silly question. I, you also know, I get fair. asked that question all the time, and I've just decided I'm not going to answer it. No, that's not true. When we started the company, uh, we called it, uh, it was very descriptive, because it was called uh, HVLS Fan Company. It rolls right off the tongue. Um, and what it stood for was high volume, low speed fans, because that's what we made. And what makes the fan so interesting is, at the time, we made fans anywhere from uh, eight feet in diameter to 24 feet in diameter. Um, and uh, the reason that's interesting is because we used a very small motor to do this. And so we could use an incredibly small amount of energy and move, ooh, uh, move air over 10, 15, 20,000 square foot of space. Uh, the people that were interested in this, fortunately, uh, were um, uh, maintenance uh, types, maintenance guys, maintenance gals, um, directors, supervisors. And uh, so when we started, there were only six of us, and we would, uh, people would call us on the phone because we did a lot of marketing. Uh, and uh, uh, people would call us on the phone and, and we would answer the phone because all of us answered the phone. There weren't that many of us. All of us also loaded the trucks and did all that other stuff. Uh, answer the phone and say, HVLS Fan Company, and there, there inevitably would be a pause. They'd say, are you those guys that make those big ass fans? <laughs> and, and because we're not the sharpest knives in the drawer, it took us a while to catch on to this. Maybe something's there. And um, uh, prior to that, we went out and uh, the, we're in Lexington uh, and uh, we found a, a, a donkey, an ass, uh, and took pictures of it. And I learned an awful lot. I'm not a farm guy. I learned a lot about Farm animals. You know, farm animals don't keep themselves very clean. Uh, and they're, they're not shy about showing their stuff. And um, which we did not realize, actually, this, this, this ass. It was very nice. He finally turned around and did exactly what I wanted to, to get the shot. But so we took a number of shots, of course, and used his visage on a number of, of different things. And I never, I, I realized when we did this that he did seem to have uh, uh, five legs. And, and, um, but I never thought that much about it. And uh, so somebody pointed out one time that, hey, you know, we're gonna have to amputate uh, Fanny because we turned him into, actually we castrated, we turned him into a, a, a girl. Uh, so his name is Fanny. Um, and, um, but anyway, so that's how we got the name. And what's interesting about that, in a sense, is that uh, in Lexington, they're a little conservative. They're not as conservative as they used to be, I guess. Uh, we bought a building. We, uh, we um, painted over a sign on the side of a building. Uh, it was a, uh, a Buffalo Trace. We painted over with Fanny's uh, Fanny. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it caused the biggest stink. And this was um, about 2002, 2003, and uh, caused a big stink. It was funny um, it, because the uh, city council got all upset. It was, it was a riot. Uh, the, um, but you know, now Louisville's got something that has a, has a piece of our story too because we used to do uh, postcards and we put Fanny's, Fanny on it. And uh, uh, so we'd say the postcard would be, because I was really into problem solution, so the postcard would be, you know, big dam. This has got a picture of the Hoover Dam, you know, and big dam ass, it's, it's Fanny. And, and uh, we did one with a plate of cheeses. You can imagine, you know, what. Jesus, what a big ass. And, and so anyway, <laughs> a, a lot of stuff like that. And one of those uh, mailings that we did came back to us, and we did bulk mailing because, you know, it's going every place. And the uh, postmaster in Louisville would not mail them, would not pass them through. Really? Which I think is illegal. But, but, we, but we didn't care because there's a great story there. I mean, you know, so we, 
Absolutely. call the papers, let's rock. I mean, you know, so, so it's been a good thing. I will say that with a name like that, it, it, I think people imagine that uh, our success, a lot of our success is due to the fact this name, which really isn't true. I think what the name is um, says more about the way we run the company, which is, a, which is sort of a contrarian approach to, uh, uh, to running a company, to, to, to running a business. And it really tells you more about that, I think, than anything else. Because we are, at the end of the day, we're a manufacturing facility, we're a manufacturing business, and we started back in 1999 uh, in Lexington, and we had, as I said, we had six people. The first year we sold a, an incredible 142 fans. I mean, it was just shocking. Uh, it, it, uh, today, or this year, uh, and, and our gross receipts that year were 400 and something thousand dollars. So like, here we are 16, 17 years later. This year, uh, we're, on, uh, we're on schedule to do just over $300 million uh, in gross receipts all over the world. Uh, and uh, we have, I don't know exactly how many uh, people work with us. Uh, it's somewhere around 900 and something, but quite a few. Uh, we, we hire a lot of people. So there, that's the reason we're successful, not because of the name of the company. No, absolutely. And just um, quickly, for the people in the room that aren't aware, you started with the Big Ass Fans, mm -hmm. but you've actually evolved into Big Ass Solutions, um, not being too myopic about the fan business, because you have expanded. So if you could just quickly share with the audience here, um, what other products do you have and what other well, services? Well, what we, uh, we have a number of things that we do, but, and we decided, um, that we couldn't describe ourselves very well with just being uh, fans. Uh, but that all goes back to the way we go to market because the way we go to market is we go direct. I mean, we actually talk to our customers and if any of y'all, and I know some of you, you do and, and some of the companies you work with or that you, uh, that you own uh, have our fans, it, when you order a fan, when you call customer service, when you call for an order, you're talking to somebody in Lexington. Uh, we do not, uh, use uh, distribution. We do very, very little retail, but just retail just to see what's, you know, just to see if it works or not. And it doesn't, so not very well. Um, and uh, um, so it, it, it uh, the, the, the key to the, to the whole thing is that we're always talking to our customers and our customers are always telling us, or we're asking, I should say, really, uh, what else we can do. Because we have this direct channel, it makes it very, very easy for us to, to, to do these things. And so we moved from the, from the uh, large industrial ceiling fans uh, into commercial, what we call commercial, which is anything other than uh, residential or industrial, uh, churches, uh, schools, auditoriums. Um, and uh, we moved from the industrial into that, and we realized when we were doing that, though, the customers wanted a big fan. They wanted to move a lot of air without incorporating a lot of uh, AC. Um, we also realized that we couldn't do that with a, with a big gearbox, which is what we use. It's very, I mean, it's full of oil in it. Even though it's not that noisy, I mean, uh, if you're listening to the, uh, you know, uh, uh, a concert, you don't necessarily want those fans on, and that sort of abrogates the purpose. So, um, so we designed and developed a, uh, a, a um, direct drive fan, which means it has no gears, it's quiet. That moved us into the commercial space, again, listening to the customers. The customers actually started, they bought that, but, but we noticed that a, that a number of them were buying these fans, very large fans, especially in Texas, uh, to put in their houses. And so you're, you've got a 12-foot fan. It's, it was crazy, really, it was interesting. Uh, we have people buying a 12-foot fan that costs $3,500. And it's not easy to install. This particular fan, it weighs almost 100 pounds. And uh, so they would have to do at least $3,500 of installation work to get it in. So they hear people buying $7,000 worth of fan. They must not like what they've got. I mean, whatever they're buying at Home Depot, they don't want it. And uh, once we got into that, we realized, well, shoot, there's a market for uh, a, a residential fan. If we made it right, if we did it right, if we built it right, uh, then the, whatever that cost to do, these people would be interested in that. And so that's what we did. And we actually now make the only 
um, uh, residential ceiling fan that's actually in the world that's manufactured here in the United States. We, we do it in Lexington. Um, but we moved from, there was a little bit of a freak out there because obviously a 60 inch fan is not a big ass fan. And so there were, but that's not enough to change the name of the company. It's still a fan. It's a little ass fan. Yeah, no, that sounded wrong. And, yeah. uh, but we did with the customers, with our industrial customers, uh, we recognized that the lighting market was something that they struggled with, especially large customers that had uh, plants all over the country. They, the, the distribution channel in so many uh, 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 businesses is, is, is constraining. And so we said, We're, we need to make you know, the world's best LED light for our customers, and we hired on the engineers to do that, and uh, about two years ago, or I think it was two years ago, we actually started manufacturing, selling those again directly to our, our customers. And with the two things, with the, the residential fan, uh, which we uh, actually bought a company uh, that manufactured motors, that designed motors, he actually was just one guy uh, located in uh, uh, Malaysia, um, we bought that company, started making the, th those fans in 2012, and started making and selling the lights in 2014. What's interesting about that is those two businesses alone this year will be larger than the businesses that we had prior to that. And so I think that one of the things that makes the company interesting is that we're continually developing new products, always. Uh, and right now, one of the products that's on uh, the uh, burner is uh, HVAC, is heating, ventilating, and air conditioning, because it's such a mess uh, in terms of not just the distribution channel, but, but the quality. Uh, if you have a house for more than 10 years, you know what the hell I'm talking about. I hate those things. So anyway, we're going to do that, and we're going to do it better. But again, the reason that we're able to do that is because we have this channel. We're not selling to distributors who are selling to agents who are selling to end users. We also make more money that way, which right. means we can put it more, more money into R&D, because we have a very large R&D facility in Lexington. Yeah, um, significantly larger than many R&D organizations, so that's one thing that has really struck me about your business. Um, another thing, having a background in innovation, um, the new product development side of things is always quite interesting to me, and what has really struck me is customer really does seem to be at the heart of what you do. Just sitting here now, you've said, and we listened to the customer, or then we heard from the customer, or in talking to the customer. And so that is just such an integral piece. Um, and it sounds like that does weave itself into your culture. Um, but another thing that has struck me, and I've been very impressed with, is your personal leadership philosophy. And what I love about it is the simplicity. And if I were to sum it up, and you and I talked about this yesterday, it really does come down to the golden rule. So do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, can you talk to us more about how that is inculcated throughout the organization? Well, I, um, uh, I can tell you the way, we, the way I think about things. Uh, and hopefully, uh, uh, those are things that other people you know, have inculcated in the way that they deal with, with other people within the company. But it, it's simply based on the fact that, that uh, in order to, to do a good job, you have to listen to your constituents. And we have, we always say we have three sets of constituents. The one set is the customer, and the customer is exceptionally important. Uh, but no less important or no more important than uh, the, the people that deal with them. Because you can't, I mean, you can't have a first class product, how could you, uh, and, and, and have uh, people working with you that, that weren't first class. And so uh, the, uh, the, we, have to, we have to take care of our people and the way we do that is uh, we pay more, uh, I think, our, our uh, wages. We don't pay minimum wage, God forbid. Um, but we pay, I think it's like 30 or 40 percent more than average in Kentucky. And 20 or 30 percent more than is average uh, across the, the country. So you have to pay them right because you, 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 you have to make sure that they recognize that they're important. Secondly, every year we uh, pay a bonus uh, based on the amount of money that the company makes. And we've always made money. Even during the recession, uh, we made a little bit of money, which we divvied up. Um, and, and then the third uh, the, uh, 
constituent are the suppliers, and people have a tendency sometimes, is, and if you, if you know anything about the automobile industry, uh, you know how poorly uh, those, um, typically those uh, manufacturers treat their suppliers. And so when you look at this with like Tanaka, with the, uh, with the uh, airbag problem, uh, you look at uh, GM with their uh, ignition problem, the way I look at that, I know that there's a supplier there that every year they're telling these people, damn it, you're gonna have to cut 5%, 5%, 5%. They kill these people. They, they act like they don't exist. Uh, they act like they're, they're, they're not valuable. They're not, the people that are working there, the people that organize those companies aren't, uh, aren't of the same caliber they are, which is terrible. So I think that it's very easy. Oh, the other thing I was gonna say was that we have 25% of the company that is set aside for our employee, uh, what we call SARS, which is a stock appreciation rights, which is like a, a, a stock option. And a number of people, actually 125 out of the 900 or so that work with us right now are engaged in that. And the reason is, I think, and this goes back to whatever you, uh, how to run a business, you learned it in kindergarten, it's not that hard, is that you should share with others and I don't know how you can ask others to, 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 uh, to work with you unless you're willing to share the, the, uh, the profits. And so that's what we try to do. And consequently, we have a very, very, very low turnover. I think our, uh, our retention rate uh, is, well, it's over 90%. And uh, so we don't lose a lot of people. Uh, we're very, very careful in hiring, obviously, because uh, we always say that Harvard uh, only accept 6% of the applicants. We only accept 1.5% of the applicants. Um, but again, I think that when you're running a small company, one of the hardest things uh, to do is to get good employees, to, is, to, is to attract people. And, uh, and we're not in Louisville. I mean, we're not in a, uh, I mean, Lexington's nice. I have to say nice things about it. But uh, uh, you can't find a good bagel in Lexington. There's no such thing. <laughs> Um, but I don't say that to people right off the bat. Um, but it's interesting, I think, that we built a culture that a lot of people want to be a part of. And uh, initially, when we started, it was hard to get people. Uh, but today, I mean, we have people even from New York. I mean, we have people from, uh, from all over the country that have come to work for us. So, uh, and I think the reason they do that is not, it's not so much a money thing. It's, it's more of a culture thing. We always say that, we're not a family, it's not a big happy family, uh, but it is a tribe. And so the tribe being a group of people that, that are culturally related in, in some uh, sense. And additionally, uh, I think it's important that we're manufacturers because manufacturers, in manufacturing you have the ability to employ people from, um, of, of all, of all uh, scopes of, uh, of uh, expertise and we have, we say we have from GED to PhD, we've got a lot, when we started we had more the, the, on the GED, GED side, but now we've got an awful lot of PhDs. And again, the only reason that you're pulling people like that in, I think, uh, are the culture more than anything else. Yeah, and the um, diversity of thought that that can bring. Yeah, yeah, no, it's important. We're very collaborative. I think, again, I've talked to some uh, groups and it's interesting uh, because I always say, you know, that, uh, that we have to make money uh, to stay in business, but we're not in business to make money, and, and not focusing on the money side of it, because that'll take care of itself if you focus on quality and taking care of your people and make, making sure everybody is working together. Um, and we're very, very uh, collaborative. And I think that helps an awful lot, because that, that drives from the employees uh, out to the customers. They recognize that right off the bat, so it's, it's it's a, it's a very, very dynamic, uh, fluid environment, and I, uh, we attract a lot of kids, our millennials, uh, and they like it. They like things that are fast-paced, and that's the way we like things, and uh, 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 they move up fairly quickly, because we're constantly growing, so it offers you an awful lot of opportunities. So. Well, so that makes me then um, think about another thing that you and I had discussed, which 
was a lot of leaders uh, can struggle with how to manage millennials, how to motivate them, how to retain them. Whereas you, um, even through the, the columns of yours that I've read, you seem to have really harnessed the potential of today's millennials. And so I would love for you to share with our audience here, um, maybe it's not a secret formula, but how have you been able to do that so successfully? I think uh, uh, having uh, ADD helps, um, and so... Uh, you can relate. Yeah, no, I got it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, I don't know. I, uh, we've found, and this sounds, this, this again, may not be PC, but um, when we deal with older uh, 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 potential employees, they have been structured by other uh, uh, companies they've worked for, and they have a feel, uh, you know, that they have a tendency to be siloed. They have a tendency not to be collaborative or as collaborative as you want. It's very difficult for them, and uh, it's just it's just a lack of flexibility. And the kids, and we get a lot of kids uh, out of school, just out of school, and after their first job and that sort of thing. Uh, they're very um, willing to do uh, just about anything because they don't have any biases like that. And uh, you can ask them to do all sorts of things, which uh, if you're thinking about this sort of thing all the time, it's easy to do. And, and um, they're very, very, very motivated to do that. And we do a lot of things that are, that are uh, focused on uh, particular age groups as well. I mean, we have every... Every weekend there's something going on. I mean, we have bowling leagues and all sorts of uh, canoeing and lacrosse and, I mean, you name it, we've got it. Uh, actually, we had the worst thing that I've ever, it, it, no, I should say this. It's not the worst thing. It sounds like more fun than you should ever, ever, ever be able to have, short of that Netflix and all that stuff you were talking about earlier. <laughs> um, but, um, and it was a trampoline volleyball. Now, you know what? Wow. Now, that sounds like fun. But we broke, I don't know how many legs we broke, uh, and we had some <laughs> compound fractures. And it's like, that sounds too much fun to be, to be able to do it. Because even at that age, now, that's fine if you're 14, but these poor people, I mean, they're thinking they're 21 and they're over the hill because they can't play this. But, uh, <laughs> but we do a lot of different things like that. We did, uh, one of the things I think is interesting is, we have, uh, obviously, uh, production uh, and engineering and a lot of sales and marketing and the whole uh, schmear customer service, and is to get all of these people together. Uh, and one way we do that is uh, we all uh, take turns doing this, but every Wednesday night uh, we go out to dinner uh, and uh, with a group of people typically uh, six uh, employees and then uh, accompanied by six of their significant others. And uh, we tried, we call it, we call it fine dining, uh, which is typical dumb joke. But, but, uh, uh, but I, I went out with them uh, last Wednesday, not last night, but last Wednesday. And uh, it's amazing, these people. But I, the first thing I told them was, that I haven't spent a thousand dollars yet doing this, and so by God, we're going to break it tonight. And we did; we just broke it. But again, it's um, it, it's something that you 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 have a lot of people that are totally different people, different backgrounds, uh, talking to one another, and and uh, it's just very very cool, I think. And when we do we do a Thanksgiving uh, and Christmas party. And we use our R&D lab, which is a very large uh, space uh, you could, where you can put these 900 people. And we, we noticed initially when we did this that everybody segregated. They just, I mean, you know, I'm working with you, so I'm going to set with you in marketing. And, and then engineering's over here, production over there. So that, that's, that's, that's not viable. No. Uh, and so now we made it now. I said, well, we've got to make it so everybody. So they have assigned seating. So... You, get, you have to interact with a lot of different people. And I just think that's, it's not only fun, but it's, it's constructive in terms of a company, in terms of uh, being able to, um, to get ideas. Because it's surprising to me sometimes where ideas come from because you can have your guy in IT that's, that's focused for whatever reason on mechanical uh, 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 parts and, and, and products and 
and they have something to say because they pay attention to that. Not that you would take to, not that you would have them engineer, not that you would have them design, right. but they have a they have an interest in that. And you don't know that until you do this sort of thing. So yeah. it's a constant. We create, we try to create friction, uh, and not in a bad sense, but I mean, the only way that you move is with friction. I mean, that's that is that's the essence. And a lot of the the uh, other companies that, that we see and that we deal with, with uh, that are more siloed, they want to avoid friction. But I think it's very important. So we try to, we try to make things. It's a it's a clash all the time. We break things. Yeah, the we try to break collisions. things. Yeah, because no, I think you have to do that. Innovation and fresh thinking, um, and all of that keeps it interesting. Yeah. And I think inherent with things like innovation, uh, or even you mentioned the examples, issues with the um, ignitions, issues with the airbags, um, there is some fear of failure that can yeah, come in no, if you are true. going to be a risk taker, um, or even a fear of getting it wrong, making a mistake. But see, that's where all these millennials, all these people make fun of them because they all got awards, you know, and all got the trophies. Well, shit, they're not afraid of, they don't yes. fail. And so they always tell people uh, when, uh, when I talk to them, because I talk to the people that come in, the new groups of people, I have a little session with them. Uh, and, and one of the most important things is that you want to innovate and that you want to be sure that you're not afraid of failure because that is the most uh, crippling, crippling thing because you, we've had very, very bright people and they're just frozen because they're afraid of failure. But these kids, shit, they're not afraid of failure. I mean, yeah. they're, they're ready to rock. So Pardon Mike, me, I didn't Mike, mean to do Mike, he that. just said shit. Where's Mike? I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry. All right, is that okay? I said ass too, is that, does that, I didn't, I didn't get thrown ass out. Ass and an asterisk for the show. No, I'm not doing that <laughs> stuff. We, we had, you know, the funniest thing we ever did, well, not that this isn't the funniest thing we ever did, but I thought that uh, we used to advertise, we used to use these cards because people would actually, uh, magazines, this is when print was big, uh, they had uh, what they call card decks and, and they would let us put our cards in there. And so I had no interest in putting our card, our fanny card, in the middle of one of these decks. It had to be on the outside. So I would tell them, well, I'm not going to do it unless I get the cover. Um, and so, which worked pretty well, and we did it for a long time. But some, some of them got a little bit savvy or a little bit concerned. And uh, one of them said, well, you can do it, but you can't use the word ass. And we said, oh, come oh. on. <laughs> well, how can we do this? But then we had an idea, and so what we did was we did ass on it, but then we, it, we made it look like we'd painted it out. But you could still see the S's. I mean, you could see, and these guys were like, yeah, okay. Which was like, <laughs> that's hilarious. I mean, we're thumbing our nose at the magazine company, and we're still getting our message out, and it was, it was great, so. so but, but that's the other thing, you know, yeah. sometimes people are just, they, you know, everybody wants to fit in, everybody wants to, you know, don't, don't be abrasive, don't, don't uh, uh, shake the, the, uh, the jar, it, 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 and that's just not true. I mean, especially today, I, I was talking to some kids at, uh, at uh, AIAS, which is their organization, the American Institute of Architects Association for Students, and they're talking about bandwidth, and I said, you know, nobody's got bandwidth. Nobody's got bandwidth at all. You've got to get inside that. You've got to make your bandwidth. You've got to talk to these people, and the way you do that is not using you know, profanity, um, though I never noticed that that didn't help, but, um, but you've, you've, got to, you've got to establish that. You can't expect people to do something for you to be interested in, in hearing what you have to say. You have to put it out in front of them. You have to make that space. So. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times, um, again, back in sort of innovation consulting, we would go into organizations and they would say, well, what are some of the issues? Why can't we get to the innovation? Why don't we have a culture such as you do at Big Ass? Um, and a common theme of many that often came up was, we would say, too polite and passive to make it happen. Um, we're gonna be really nice to each other in that meeting and we're all going to agree with it. And then we're gonna walk out into the hallway and say, that's never gonna work and I'm not gonna go for it. Rather than having those rich debates and that disruptive, that positively disruptive conversation as we talked about earlier. Um, I think playfulness is also another piece of that. And while you take your business quite seriously, there is a very natural element of play. Um, and I'd love to You've talk to you. You've been misinformed on that. <laughs> 
I, really? Because <laughs> I'm getting the impression you're somewhat <laughs> playful and yet very serious in what you do. Um, what do you think are the benefits of bringing more of a playful attitude and more fun into the workplace? I, it's, we're, that's our lives. I mean, that's what we do, and we don't separate. I know that there's this big deal about you know separating your work life from your home life, and there, there really should be to a degree. I mean, we're, I always tell people that we're paying you for eight hours, so by God, I want to make sure that you're happy with what you're doing because, because that's your life. I mean, I'm spending your life for you uh, in a way that, that I think is important. So you've got to buy into this. But having said that, we try to be uh, playful. I mean, we used to have, uh, on Friday afternoons, we had donkey fights because we make little, everything revolves around this. You know, I'm <laughs> thinking about this. It's just all about ass. And so, uh, but, if but we had If someone could tweet that, all about ass, yeah. that'd be amazing. Well, Thank that's you. interesting. At uh, Lee Louisville. But we have these, right, but we have these uh, <laughs> little foam donkeys, these little foam fannies. And uh, so we have, uh, we used to have this more, I, I admit, uh, 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 fanny fights on Friday afternoon because then everybody starts throwing them at each other. But and that was fine until we got some of these little boys that you know they were baseball pitchers. And I want to tell you something: when you can throw a fanny from one side of the office, and this is a long, I mean, this is a big place, to the other side and have some uh, speed on it, that's that's when everything stops. Um, so we bought Nerf guns, and um, which is a lot safer, really. Uh, Levels the playing field, right? Yeah, well, yeah, because the girls can't throw them as hard. They have, they have more of, and I, I tell, I've tried to tell them, you've got to lob this thing, not the girls, everybody, because otherwise you're going to get hurt. Uh, but, uh, uh, but we do that, and then when we have an especially good sales day, then we break out the bourbon and the beer. Uh, but we have, I think what's interesting about that is now a lot of these are kids, okay? Yeah. So we have a beer fridge. And it's always open. And, and no, you're not supposed to get into it, but people don't. I mean, it doesn't have a lock on it. And so, but when we have a, a, a really good sales day, they'll say the beer fridge is open and all of these people go down and they get a beer uh, and they get one beer. And they don't, I mean, you know, we don't lose beers. I just think that's cool that, that they're, I don't know. They're all, I guess all of these are the kids that in, uh, when they were doing the test in kindergarten, when they put the marshmallow on the plate, they left the marshmallow They did not the eat the marshmallow. They did not eat the marshmallow. <laughs> and those are the kids that we hire. I didn't know that, but that's how we do it. That's how you win them out. If you see somebody with three beers, you got, nah, man, I made a mistake here. Um, but they're pretty good with that. Uh, and we also do bourbon, so they, but the kids normally do the beer. They wouldn't do the bourbon. I've learned a lot about bourbon. Shoosh. Oh, absolutely. As of I recently having moved to Kentucky. Yeah, crazy. Uh, Yes, so if you want a quick laugh, do Google the Marshmallow Children's video if you have yet to seen it. Highly entertaining. Uh, maybe not quite as entertaining as you know, the big ass nature of things, but very, very good. Um, I wanted to ask you about Dr. Seuss. So uh, often we will ask business leaders, you know, what books do you go to? Who, you, who do you admire? Um, what, what's your reading list? For business, um, and you know, not that you eschew any of that, but you're actually more inspired by things that aren't as obvious. And you have written about Yertle the Turtle, and what you have learned from that book. And so, um, I would like to hear, though, what else inspires you apart from Dr. Seuss, um, and probably people that just do the right thing and are bold and audacious. What or who else inspires you? Well, I, I always say that uh, I, I like Yertle the Turtle because uh, Yertle gets to, to give it to the man in the end. And, uh, and that's the way it ought to be because if you don't, if you don't look after the Yertle, uh, and I don't know if you know this story, but, but it's, um, uh, no, it was Yertle. Yertle was the turtle. I've forgotten. Jeez, this is terrible. Because uh, I'm thinking it's Mac is the one that, gets, that does it to Yertle. But, but anyway, so what happens is the king of, of turtles stacks, the more turtles he stacks up in his little pond, the further he can see, and he just keeps stacking up turtles. And it was, it was, they were all suffering. And then finally, Mac the turtle says, he's not gonna take it anymore, and puts Yertle in the pond. Uh, and so the last picture is Yertle's got mud on his head. But the point of it is, is that you have to look out. You can't expect people just to do your bidding uh, for you. You have to, you have to share. And I think that's the thing. And then the other thing that I 
find interesting was I worked for a guy, people are always asking, well, who's a role model? And it's like, ah, well, I don't know. But, but then I think about it, and I worked for a guy when I was in high school, uh, after school, at a Tom McCann store, we sold shoes, and, and we're just a bunch of kids. Uh, I mean, we had, the assistant manager was 19, which was incredibly old. I mean, how do you get that old, really? Uh, he was crazy, and he had a steady girlfriend, and what the hell, and, and a car, and geez. Um, but, um, but this guy, uh, he hardly made any money, and we had, the way we got paid, uh, you could see how much he made, because this is a long time ago, and we had a, a payroll sheet, and, and so all of us kids had to sign it, and so you'd work, and you'd get paid $20 or $21 or something for your week's work, your part-time work. And Mr. Lane, who was the manager, uh, you could see what he got paid, and he got paid $147 uh, a week, and so which was nothing. And he drove this beat-up car, and he lived forever away from uh, the suburbs. This is uh, in Washington or outside of Washington, D.C. And, um, but the thing about it was every uh, Thanksgiving, he would put on a spread, he and his wife, and, and Tom McCann's is cheap, is, is tight, tighter than drums, uh, so they had nothing to do with this, but, but he put on this spread and they brought in all of this food and uh, set up the tables, and while we were still working, which again, when you're 16, that's like cool, I'm getting paid and I'm eating, it's like, <laughs> it doesn't get better, but, um, but it was just the coolest thing, and he did it just because that's what he wanted to do. And even at the time, it seemed special. And all of the, it wasn't just the, the, the people that worked in the shoe store at that time. They would bring in everybody that had worked for a long period of time, and just a bunch of, not kids, but younger people. Um, and it was just great. And it remind me, reminds me of Fezziwig, uh, which if you, uh, Charles Dickens with the uh, uh, a Ghost of Christmas Past, where he visits uh, with Scrooge that first night, uh, visits uh, his past, and, and Fezziwig is the, is, was the, uh, the equivalent, the, or the, the uh, proprietor of a uh, Scrivener or a, or a accounting uh, shop. And on the day before Christmas, rather than working the Bob Cratchits right up to the, to the end, he uh, stopped work, rolled up the carpet, and they had a big party. And I, I always think that it, that was very special to Scrooge. Um, and I think it says a lot, again, it says something about Yertle and Mac. It says something about uh, Mr. Lane at the shoe store. And it says something to me about the way you have to live life, at least when you're, you're running a business. Because I think running a business is, is a, uh, you have an awful lot of opportunity to do a lot of good things because uh, you're paying people, you're giving them, uh, I mean, every, we're all working together. It's a very social uh, environment. Uh, and, I mean, gosh, I mean, we distribute, oh, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 million dollars, which for some of y'all, that's not a big deal, I guess, but uh, in terms of payroll a year, but you're not just helping those people that are there, it's their families, and then, of course, they spend and so on, and so it, it gives you a very direct way of having an impact on, on a society, so. Um, but anyway, so that's, I'm not enamored of Warren Buffett or, God right. forbid, the Donald, who's not really a businessman. Developers are not business Mr. people. Drumpf, Mr. Drumpf. Mr. Drumpf, yes. Mr. Drumpf, I believe Drumpf. it is, yes. yes. Um, so, apologies if, yeah, if that, that wasn't sen cool. If you're uh, sensitive. <laughs> So the final question I'm going to ask uh, before I get to turn it over to all of you, um, and we're looking forward to your questions, is Mr. Lane, uh, that first boss, if you will, your 19-year-old boss, seemed to have really left a lasting impression on you, um, and one that actually um, you still hearken back to today. And what is the impression, the lasting impression that you'd like to leave um, on others? You no, know, that I think that that's it. At, at running a business, owning a business, that I think is a good impression, is, is, to, is to imagine that people would remember you as, as somebody that, 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 uh, that expanded their uh, wherewithal to, to, uh, for a bigger life, uh, for a better life, uh, and for their children and their children's children. We talk about a 200-year company, which is a very vague thing, but what it really says, I think, is that 
Uh, we're not interested in the short term. We don't do things short term. And again, uh, we're, we're lucky in that it's a privately held company, so we don't have to pay an awful lot of attention to uh, quarterly. Uh, I mean, we don't have to make a profit. I mean, we do, but we don't have to. I mean, we don't. when we invest in something, we look at things two, three, four, five years. We talk about that sort of thing. And it's not for me, it's for the tribe. And I think that's a, that's a, a higher calling, if you will. So I think that's where you're going. That's where I'm going. Well, thank you for that. No, oh, thank you. Um, and I don't want to monopolize all of his time, so please, let's turn it over to all of you. And now's the time for questions. Thank you, that was great. I've got a little bit of an esoteric question, and I might also ask you to comment on the nature of the kind of uh, environment that Kentucky provides for your business. Um, it's, the, it's the relationship between creativity and innovation, and then creating what you have created. And obviously, you're trying to find creative people who are capable of innovating and creating great products for people. Could you comment just a little bit about uh, the kind of people that you're trying to find in terms of creativity and how they would become innovators in your company, and then the environment that might be necessary in the school system, colleges and universities, and maybe from a policy perspective in supporting businesses like yours? There might be three or four questions embedded. That was a big ass oh, I've, question. I've, I've got one answer. <laughs> Great. Uh, just stay out of our way. Uh, it would be my, uh, my response in general. I think that everybody, I don't think that there's, I mean, obviously you expect or you hope that you have a lot of creative people, but I honest to gosh think that a lot of people are creative. It's simply, you have to, you have to make sure that you don't uh, crush that uh, within people. And I think a lot of other, and that's why I say the, the people that have worked with other companies, they, it's like their, their creativity, their spirit is crushed in a certain way. And I think that it's important from our perspective to make sure that you, that you uh, uh, try to bring that out in everybody. And that's not to say, because as we all run companies, and you know that uh, the 80% of the people you have are some large number or not, you know, they want to get off work and, and do that Netflix thing. And, and, uh, <laughs> but, but, and that's what they're thinking about. That's their life, and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And it's a smaller percentage that are going to be uh, motivated to do this. But what what I'm always looking for, I think what we look for, is we look for people that take the initiative, people that have done different things. I'll tell you, the, one of the first questions we ask, and I, this is, I mean, everything is connected, I suppose, but is, I mean, how did you put yourself through school? How did you put yourself through college? And I think what you'll find if you talk to people that, that, uh, uh, that work at our company, you'll find an awful lot of them um, uh, work their way through school. I mean, they paid for schooling themselves, themselves, and uh, are they in the process of doing that? And so I think that that's, that shows a certain level of uh, organization and drive, and that's what's important. But in terms of creativity, I mean, you know, everybody's creative to a degree. Uh, it, and, and I think that we're collaborative because we're not all, I mean, not one individual. That doesn't make a company. I mean, the reason we're a company is the same reason you have a university, is you bring all of these things together, and that's, you, there's a certain synergy that, that, uh, uh, that develops from that. Uh, that's what's important. I don't know if that answered it or not. Great, so who we else? We have another mic on that side, and I'll head toward you, Trish. Actually, not sure how to move. Excuse me. <laughs> Trisha Burke. Uh, two questions. One, how has your leadership style changed since the inception of your company in 1999 to now? And two, what is it that landed big ass in Lexington? Well, see, both of those answers are just boring, boring. <laughs> I mean, uh, we wound up in Lexington uh, because my wife uh, is an attorney and she didn't like working for a firm and she got a job uh, with uh, um, uh, 
what's yum now, but uh, at the time was uh, Long John Silver's, um, as a risk manager, legal. And uh, so it was just ha happens. As I said, uh, they don't have good bagels in Lexington, and, and uh, she ripped me away from Atlanta. So I mean, you know, I've, got, I've held a grudge for a long time. Um, and what was the other question? Oh, how has the leadership changed? I think that it, it, that's a long time, and I, I think about this occasionally because even people that work with us uh, ask, well, did you ever imagine that the company would be this big? And, and I know that they mean well when they ask that. I know they're interested in, but, but no, of course we didn't. I mean, you, you, I mean, you do everything day to day, and, and uh, I'm sure that my uh, style has changed. I think, though, by the time we started, or that I started working or building this company, uh, that I was old enough uh, to be a lot nicer than I was when I was younger, because trust me, I would not, I wasn't, maybe uh, as nice as I am today. Uh, but I do think that, that uh, the, um, the sort of leader, I mean, the way you treat people, I don't know that that's ever been different, because you can't get people, you have to have a vision. Uh, people like that, you have to take care of people, you have to do what's right uh, for people, otherwise nobody's gonna follow you. I mean, you, but because when you're a small company, when you're very small, a lot of it depends on just that interaction. It's just a very personal, uh, personal thing. And we have a lot of people, um, now that I think about it, of that six that still work for us. There's at least three or four of them that, that started out with us, then have been with the company um, for a long time, for 16, seven, 16, 17 years. Ugh, I hate even saying that. <laughs> we have another question. Hello. Well, I'm still trying to get over your culture stealing one of my employees, but <laughs> <laughs> sucker. Uh, you talk about <laughs> failure and not being afraid of failure. What was your biggest failure, and what did you learn from it? Oh, oh Jesus! Why do you ask questions like this? You awesome. know, this makes me wonder. This whole Q and A thing with the audience. You know, it you was your to... idea. I'm just saying. I know. I know it was. It, it, uh, not the best ideas. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, right off the top of my head, uh, where I thought that I'd made the biggest mistake was when I was going to graduate school and I ran out of money going to graduate school because I made a mistake and I took, I, 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 I thought at the time that I knew more than I did uh, in terms of uh, quantitative economics and I found myself trying to teach myself calculus uh, uh, during the first quarter, which is I would not advise anybody to do. Uh, I didn't do it. I mean, I tried, but I didn't do it. Uh, and consequently, I ran out of money, uh, and I just perceived that as failure. I mean, I didn't finish what I'd started, and I always wanted to go to this school, and it was very frustrating. Um, and then I became a janitor. So, I mean, you know, I just, I really, laid into it hard. But no, I didn't. I like being a janitor, actually. I can mop a floor like nobody's business. I actually, when I, when uh, the, um, the, our, uh, uh, the uh, janitors, I don't know what they call them today, really. That's what we called ourselves. I think custodian, uh, maybe. Custodian, no, that's Is not that a right? lot better. I don't know, housekeeping. Is that even accurate? But, uh, uh, but anyway, so I tell them, you know, if you want to know how to, I mop floors like nobody's business. I can really mop a floor. Um, but no, I would say that that was probably it because it was quitting and, 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 but I'll tell you this, what's interesting about that is when you have that, it's like, how do you make a pearl? I mean, how does an oyster make a pearl? You first have to have abrasive. I mean, you have to have the sand uh, because you react to that all the time. And I think that that gives you something to fight against and I think that's a good thing, really. Um, so. That's my story, I'm gonna to stick to that one. And I'll see you later. <laughs> uh, you may have another employee I want, so. Uh -huh. <laughs> one more question over here, Anne-Marie. Jennifer can come. Hello. Um, so when I, I was at a university, when I was at college, we bought a big ass fan for our gym, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. And we wanted to have a big ass party to celebrate the big ass fan. Um, but we got shut down for that. I'm not sure if it was the party idea or the name of the party that got us shut down. I think it was the name. 
Um, but the question then is, if we don't all work at places like Big Ass Fans, how can we still be edgy and creative without being offensive? To some people that might see ass as offensive. Well, I, I, and again, I think that those are two separate things. Uh, and I really could not, I mean, I, I've never, uh, I mean, I don't work, I've not had to work for a large company. Well, I did once uh, for a while. Um, and so I think it would be very difficult to do that, to, 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 to try to fit in uh, to a culture like that. I think that in reaction to that, the best you can do is you can try to be as open, as collaborative as you possibly can. But the other, on the other side of it, I, we were talking, uh, I, we were probably mic'd up too, so some of you heard us. Um, th there are, in my estimation, so many opportunities out there in the world in terms of business. And I think that a lot of business uh, in doing well in business is attitude. It's nothing more than that. I mean, it's a little bit of money, but the money is just uh, lubricant. I mean, you can, you can get started you start very small. You don't have to go uh, Mark Zuckerberg it right off the bat. I mean, you don't need to go to a VC or PE or anything like that. Um, but there are an awful lot of opportunities out there. And, and if you feel that, I mean, you have to realize that you're going to, like, kick the bucket one day and you're going to be laying there. I always think this way. This is a, this is a driving force. Um, and, uh, and so as you spend your final minutes and you look back on your life, are you going to be able to say, yeah, I, I, I used that. I did that right. I mean, I, I, I fulfilled that. Um, I filled that properly. I mean, I did the best I could do. Uh, and I think that if you look at that today and you say that to yourself, no, I can't because I'm not in the right place and I'm not doing the right thing, I have people working for me and I can't really be completely honest with them and tell them what to do because you might wind up saying, hey guys, get the hell out of here because you ain't going any place here. Uh, is that you start looking at taking uh, charge of your, your own life like that because it's, 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 it's totally different, I think, uh, and it's very, very uh, empowering to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And, and you wind up, honest to God, you wind up doing a lot of things that, that you'd probably do today. You have to work, but, uh, but uh, you don't have to put up with any schmuck that's got half your IQ. That's the key. That's the key to business. And there's lots of people out there that have half that IQ. And that's why business is actually not that hard, because you're in competition with those people. <laughs> I'm serious, it's crazy. They're all out there, and they're constrained by this, by, this, uh, by this structure. So, I mean, the world's your oyster. There's that oyster again. Asses yeah. and oysters. Asses and oysters. Uh, maybe we'll call it around. that if you were ever to bless us with your presence again. <laughs> right. Uh, do we have another? Oh, we have a few more over here. I mean, uh, uh, in relation to what they do for the company, uh, uh, that's difficult. I, I, I know there have to be, there have to be people like that. Uh, I mean, they obviously don't do anything at the company that they've ever done before because that's stale. So it's not as if, I mean, you really do have to take the blinders off when you do this sort of thing. Uh, but... Um, I mean, from different fields, <coughs> people that do different things. I mean, they might have been in IT and now they're in sales, might have been in sales and now they're in purchasing. I mean, there are people like that. But in, in terms of school, I don't know. I really, I'm trying to think of, I don't know. Not right off. It wouldn't matter. I mean, you know, you could be, <coughs> if you had a, if what you were really good at was, uh, was disassembling car engines, I mean, and you did a really good job of it, uh, that would be cool. I mean, we wouldn't, we're not disassembling any car engines today, but, but I mean, the mindset, it's just a mindset. It's a character thing. I always say, 
So we have people sending resumes in, which are the worst thing in ever, 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 um, because they don't say anything. And what I'm really looking for, I always tell people I'm looking for a story, so tell me a story. Tell me a story about something that you faced, a problem you had, how you solved that, or just a really interesting time in your life. And I think the way people approach things like that is, is indicative of whether they're gonna be able to work with us, because we hire a lot of people where there's no job. I mean, I'm, if you find the right person, I mean, what the hell, you don't need a job. I mean, figure that out. I mean, you can build a company around a job. We, we've had, uh, I have a guy right now that actually building a division around him because I wasn't thinking about it, but I mean, you could do it because he's got those skills. Um, so, I mean, people are everything, absolutely everything. Yes. You know, I tell you, I was thinking about this because we were talking about it. So we were in uh, Soho uh, a couple of months ago, and we got them from Bob's Bagels, which sounds ridiculous, but they were the best bagels in New York. Uh, hmm? Yeah, but you know, I don't think I like H&H. &H. And, 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 uh, and... Uh, well, wait a minute, but you guys have good bagels. <laughs> You guys have good bagels here because Nancy's bagels, I think, are very good. And we actually drive to Louisville to get Nancy's bagels. But wow. That's cool. We They're good. We can just good. send you some. Yeah, right. I just uh, left a 500-person company and formed my own 8-person company. And uh, I have a lot of people that have been working with me Well, I, I don't think fear, uh, I mean, fear's a driver. I don't know that it's good to have it. I think that when you're starting a company, if you're not afraid, you're insane and you ought to be doing something else. Um, I do think that once you get past a certain point, um, you, have to, you have to have different types of fear. I mean, we have fear, I have fear of larger companies. I have fear of, of uh, recessions. Um, and things of that nature, which, which 10 years ago or, or 19 years ago or 16 years ago, whatever, I didn't worry about things like that because when you're starting, a recession is nothing. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, it's just water over your head. It's nothing, you're in the water. Um, and, uh, but I think you always have fear, but, but I think that, that that can be a very positive thing because that, that keeps, you, keeps you motivated. And the important thing is to be motivated and don't, when you get to the point where you're not worried about money, then you'll start being successful. And, that's, and, and I realize that's easy to say, that's easy for me to say. Um, and it's hard when you're starting because that's what you're thinking about all the time because you've got to pay for all of these things. Um, but that's when you, when you notice that you're not, that's not what you're concerned with. You're concerned with something else. You're concerned with a new product, new market, new something. Uh, that's when I think you're starting to succeed. And because there are a lot of people, all they worry about is money. This is craziness. There's this guy in Milan. See, you didn't think we'd come all the way back. Uh, Full circle. But so anyway, so I go to a design show in Milan, or I haven't been in a couple of years, but it's interesting. And so the last time I went without my wife, so it's gotta be deadly dull and boring. And, and so when I'm with her, we go to these nice restaurants, but you know, when you're by yourself, you just schlub. And, I, I, I did it late, so I wound up with a uh, not-so-nice hotel near the train station, and there was a cafeteria and a guy, and I went there every day, because it was good, and I had the zuppa. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but there was the owner of the, of the cafeteria who sat right in the middle, and he collected the money. And, and he always looked bored as, as he could possibly look. And then behind him, uh, on the wall behind him, there was a picture of him setting at the cash register, collecting the money. And, and I thought, you know, that's gotta be a horrible life. I mean, he apparently owns and runs this place, but all he's thinking about is sitting there in the middle of the cafeteria collecting money. 
And that's just not good, I don't think. So you don't, don't do that. You're not running a cafeteria, are you? I didn't think so. It's called Zupa. Zupa. And on that note, <laughs> I'm going to pass Sorry. it over to Mike. If we, had, if we had an orchestra, it'd be playing right now at the Oscars. Sorry. <laughs> You could hum. Uh, <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> thank you, uh, Lisa and Carrie, for a fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you all.